preparing to live stream the webinar. It is prepping. Okay. It is 50% prepping. Done. Directing to YouTube as I mute myself immediately. And I am muting that. Awesome. Well, according to this, Mr. J, we are now live. And I can't tell if anyone is watching us, but that's okay. I don't mind if people aren't watching because they can watch it later and we can still have a blast regardless yeah, of anybody is, else. Okay, so this is going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, for sure. Oh, people are starting to pour in. Uh, Carisu, Kelsey Mayer um, saying hi and wow. sup. Trinity Shaftsma, yo. Um, and uh, okay, well, we have people watching. That's excellent. Okay. I'm going to say hello. Hey, guys. Renteru. Hey, Chase and Jay. Yeah, okay. Well, everyone's very excited. So, so uh -huh. Jay. What yes. do you have for us this week, <laughs> this month? <laughs> well, and yeah, I guess it's been almost a month yep. since we did our uh, stream on uh, Harry and Meghan and the royal family. Um, as a matter of fact, the Queen's birthday was this past week, 94 years old. Really? Um, yes. I didn't know that. How did that yeah. go? <laughs> um, it went pretty good. They did everything via like a, a Zoom conference call, apparently um to wish to wish her majesty happy birthday um but we decided to keep the theme of royalty going this week all right and we decided to shift to american royalty um not the kardashians not the kardashians. <laughs> that was the original the original thought but no we had a better example not quite as stuffy as the royal family stuffy. in britain but we're going to talk about Joe Exotic and the Tiger King. And um, I think it's going to be a good show. I, I definitely agree with you, Jay. Um, I will admit that it was an extremely painful uh, show for me to watch. Uh, but I got through it and it has renewed my sense of conviction and how I uh, am living my life and also... Uh, uh, the direction that uh, we're taking this community for a better world. Because holy smokes, when you are uh, faced with uh, that level of depravity, I mean, yeah. it's just like, I, I, how often did you feel like you had to take a shower after watching an episode? <laughs> well, it was painful. It was very painful. And frankly, I didn't realize that, that people actually lived that way or that kind of sociality uh, really existed. Um, depravity is the right word. Um, it is, it is absolutely depravity. Uh, although, you know, I talk about depravity a lot here, you know, on this YouTube channel and within this community, etc. But depravity doesn't always come from intuitive perceiver types, it doesn't always come from introverted sensing inferior or introverted sensing child, it can come from. ENFJs, it can come from INTJs, as we are about to find out. It can come from uh, ESFPs, you know, uh, ISTPs even. So it's everyone has a, a part to play, just yeah. like Joe Exotic uh, playing his part by keeping onions in his pocket so that uh, he can, uh, you know, fake cry for the cameras at any moment he can uh, to capitalize on the death of his husband, Travis. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like, wow. Well, holy smokes. It, it, it was rough. It was rough. And, but, you know, well, and maybe we ought to make, maybe we ought to say something. We're assuming that everybody has seen it or knows enough about it. There may be some folks in the audience who haven't seen it. Um, we don't want to give any way, give away any spoilers, but at the same time, um, you almost have to watch it in order to understand what we're going to be talking about, don't you? So, um, yeah. <laughs> uh, but maybe we don't want to wish that on anyone. It, it's going to be fun. We're going to have fun time tonight talking about this and talking about the interplay of these different personalities and why people do, did the things they did on the show. What yeah. their motivations were. Well, Jay, lead us, lead us through. Yeah. Tell us where to start. And uh, I am happy to provide any commentary as well as uh anecdotes from real life uh, to uh 
to kind of uh, add additional support for what the hell is going on here. <laughs> well, let's let's just start start at the king himself. All right. Let's let's do a type typing of him, um, and uh, maybe ask the audience if they have any initial inclinations. But let's start with typing him. Okay, sure, we can we can do that. And I really hope your sound settings are identical to what they were last time because we didn't check and I forgot about that. <laughs> Whoops. They should be. They should be. Are... Let me uh, let me double check. I, right. I didn't change the settings. Yeah, so... I didn't change anything here. Same same uh, machine. Okay. Well, um, I am going to do that. And which video did you want me to look at first? Um, going back to your yeah. messages. Either of the two uh, for Joe Exotic. There's one and two. I'd just start with number one. Okay, number one. Joe Exotic, number one. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I got to maybe scroll further. Yeah, that, yes, I do. Um, oh, that was a Meghan Markle post. That's not it. Uh, <laughs> interview one. I got it right here. Awesome. All right. Cool. Copy link. And, uh, and I'm also gonna uh, erase um, my little board here to make sure this is uh, actually usable. One second here, erase it, and erasing it, erasing it, erasing it. All right, okay. Um, all right, and then I'm gonna all right, cool. Got that there. Thank you all for your patience. Just didn't do uh, the uh, due diligence at, at the beginning, but uh, we should have it now. And also folks in the audience, please let us know if you guys can hear us. We're trying to make sure that we have the audio piped in appropriately. Uh, so one second, I'm going to hit the share button as soon as I can. I'm going to have to switch back and forth because we're using Zoom here. Um, okay, so... We got Joe here, and then I'm gonna hit the share button right now. And here we go. So that's what we're gonna see from my screen as we're in this. Let me know if you guys can hear, please. Uh, I'm gonna hit play. I cannot hear it. You cannot, okay. Well, I think I have to hit an extra button for that one second. I'm going to stop that share. I'm going to hit share again. Uh, there it is. Uh, share computer sound. Awesome. Uh, thank you. That should do it this time. All right, cool. Let's do it again. And okay, so that they can hear it. Uh, it sound. Oh, yeah, okay. So, but drive can you hear it now? Everybody's like, yeah. Joey Colic. Okay. But, uh, awesome. I am the entertainer here. I am the tiger trainer. I am the pizza. I am the entertainer here. I'm the tiger trainer here. I'm the, oh, hold on. How many else is up? guy, I'm the burger cook. I, I'm the cub guy, I'm the burger guy. Uh, I do most of uh, social marketing and I love every bit of what I do. I, <laughs> I love every bit of what I do. Okay, okay. Yeah, I wonder what what uh, what that is. You know, nice, um, um, oops, oh, hold on. Let's, uh, let's get into, uh, not that sharing button. I'm sharing the wrong thing. There we go. Let's share the correct thing. So good old Joe Exotic. Yes. And, uh, you know, that was pretty obvious. He's like, he, start, he's, he starts in, you know, it's like, hey, I'm just going to talk about myself, you know, and uh, I'm going to give you this huge list of all of these little titles that I have. So it's like, oh, yeah, that's a TE point for each, every title he listed there, which is four in a row. <laughs> So like automatically an FITE user right off the bat going after this list. He's also initiating an entirely different point in that same sentence. So he's obviously initiating and then uh, a point for informative, which means he'd be informative initiating or uh, a progression based on that. Mm -hmm. And if that's the case, we knew that, uh, you know, just off the bat, he'd be a starter type. And if he's an FIT user, we know that, okay, if you're a starter type and you're an FIT user, you are either an ESFP or an ENFP. Now, if I remember correctly, uh, Mr. J, you had a bet as to which type okay. he was, and it was between those two, right? It was between those two. Uh, uh, member of the team and I had been 
debating about it. He chose one, I chose the other. So we've got a little wager going on here. Little wager, little wager. All right. Well, let's uh, let's definitely uh, let's keep going for sure. Right. Going to hit the new share button. We're going to go right back to uh, the uh, um, uh, awesome. You know, actually, I'm going to going to hit the screen too. Actually, maybe this will be a little bit better. Tell me if you guys can't see anything and hear anything. Maybe hit play again. Hopefully, you guys can still hear. And you were talking earlier that you got into this after the death of your brother. Tell me a little bit about that. Right. Uh, the original park was built in memory of my brother. Uh, we owned a pet store in six, uh, for 16 years in Arlington, Texas. And he got killed by a drunk driver. And when I signed the papers to shut his life support machine off and donate his organs, I, I promised him he just wouldn't be another statistic. So uh, I promise me and my mom and dad started this uh, you know, whole thing in 1998. And, uh, you know, with the help of, of other corporations taking over and, and bigger money and everything else, it, it's a world famous place. I think. It's a it's a world. It's a world famous place, Jay. World famous. I'd never heard of it before until I saw the show, frankly. But <laughs> yeah, got a point for expert sensing. He's constantly talking about his brother a lot. Another point for expert sensing um, and just really obviously seems like a wayfarer which would put him as an ESFP. Yes, I know, guys, that we can go in really in-depth here with typing, but I've already watched the show. I kind of basically know his type, and there's really not much to verify there with this. So just hang in there with us, and we could go on and on and on typing every single person in this without actually talking about the dynamics as to what's actually happening. So please be patient with us but well yeah. and I think that's where i think that's where the real interest is going to come tonight is not in the typing itself but in the interaction yeah exactly how they do things. and you know that that does bring up a good point chase is because we know that you know typically you like to go into into these um famous typing sessions without really any preconceived notions and we we talked about well should we allow you to do that tonight or did you really need to see the show? And yeah, that was that was the discussion because I asked I asked the team like before we did this, I'm like, okay, are you sure you guys want me to watch the show and like bias me to like all of the things that are actually happening? And they're like, yes, it's <laughs> not about telling the audience exactly what type he is. It's more about telling the audience about what's really actually going on behind the scenes and all their heads. Right. Uh, you know, with their types, et cetera. Well, and we were all, we were so distracted by the, just the, the weirdness of it all that we couldn't even focus on trying to type anybody because they were all so weird. But anyway, um, <laughs> so uh, you're so we right. That, that was going to happen too. But anyway, so ESFP for Joe Exotic. ESFP. It, it's just, it's so interesting to me, you know, that he's an ESFP. Um, when I first, when I first uh, started watching the show, I'm like, oh, this guy just looks so ISFP, like, like, um, you know, and then, and then all of a sudden comes out with his flashy shirts and, mm -hmm. and then it just started getting, I mean, this guy is, is larger than life. And uh, I'm like, wow, he, he's definitely an ESFP. And what really got me to the point of like, you know, going all in on his extroversion, other than the fact that he's initiating every 10 seconds, every time he talks and cutting himself off like a typical starter type would, it's that he loves so much to be on stage all the time. The camera's rolling on stage. Uh, it, has, it has a huge commanding stage presence as well as a, a unlimited charisma. In fact, I think, I think one of the guys interviewed inside of the documentary actually said that. Um, he did. Well, and his one of the first bullet points that he said in that uh, video was, I'm an entertainer. I mean, I'm an entertainer. <laughs> do we need to go any further than that? That's the ESFP right there. Yeah, yeah. We call the ESFP the duelist nowadays, but we used to call the ESFP the entertainer. And that was the label taught to me by my my mentors is that they're the entertainer. And the ESFP archetype out of all of the archetypes is the one that focuses on entertaining people. Mm -hmm. And 
remember they share that same outlook that ENFPs have, you know, in the absence of communication or explanation, perceptions become reality. They don't care about being good as much as they care about looking good. As long as I look authentic, it's all good. This is why I tell people, hey guys, FI is not about authenticity. TI actually is. Mm. It's just FI looks like authentic. It just looks authentic. Um, but then again, how are you defining authentic? Is it is it honesty? Yeah. TI is typically more honest than FI to begin with. And how often do you see an FI user being honest about their feelings? It's usually when they're really upset that that's when that happens. Whereas TI, I mean, like, like for example, you're talking to an ISTP or an INTP, they're just going to tell you to you straight. And that's just the way it is, you know, if you're going to go for like a TI hero example. And, you know, and this is one of the reasons why I maintain, you know, FI is not authentic and it is not authenticity. And uh, so many people out there think it's this way. That's why we have people in the audience like um, ESTP superego um, talking in the... Uh, ENTP Rogue channel on the CSJ Discord today, um, you know, uh, talking about how, you know, uh, Chase's definition of an ENTP is culturally an ENFP, you know, et cetera. And like, no, I, I, I fundamentally disagree with that because again, people have their backwards definitions of cognitive functions and there's just, you know, like we're literally Galileo and the world is round to us, but to everyone else is the world is flat as we consistently see in Facebook groups. But Hey, you know, Good an enough. ESFP can make it as Joe exotic has uh, proven that he can make it. And it's, you know, as, as manipulative as this guy is, and then to see him being manipulated at the same time, like it's like, well, that is interesting. Um, well, speaking of, manipulative let's let's go to character number two let's kind all of right. stage here all right all right yeah yeah let's uh let's lead the way Wait, character number two is is who uh mr carol J. Say, carol, baskin. carol carol baskin oh my goodness carol baskin so in case we've got some folks while you're pulling that up chase in case some sure. folks not totally familiar um um joe exotic has a zoo uh, Carol Bax, Baskin has a, um, um, a, a rescue for big cats and they're at each other's throats because she claims what he's doing is abusive. I mean, if it's a rescue, if it's a rescue and we're going to talk about that, but, um, anyway, so that's kind of, that's the, that's the primary story here. So Carol Baskin, we'll let you go. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. All right, I'm going to get sharing up again, uh, do screen two and share computer sounds. All right. Obligatory must pause it so I don't get nailed for copyright. Sorry. <laughs> J at WMNF.org. No, no, no. Where is she like actually talking? Let's see. Here we go. Oh yeah, there there she is. This is like not even from the show either, which is even better, you know. Like these are actual real people, you know. Animals, you have to get involved in politics. That's the only way you're going to fix the problem. You know, when it comes to the care of animals, you have to get into politics because that's the only way you're going to fix the problem. Hmm. Hmm. I wonder what that sounds like, Mr. J. I think that sounds like being affiliative right off the bat. She is affiliative. Talking about using politics to care for for the animals you know because that's that's what that's what we do here apparently <laughs> yeah <laughs> so it's it's changed my um it hasn't changed my attitude toward it but it's changed my willingness yeah toward you, it because <laughs> you've pushed past that attitude about uh, public speaking and, and those kinds of uh, experiences it sounds like yeah so okay so so really as you kind of alluded to i mean anyone that's really been around the animal world um uh, against that so that it's really um so so tell us about uh you know some uh some of the hey by the way you guys did see that meme where this baskin robbins reader board said that they were not related to carol baskin on it right did you see that on instagram i did i thought that was amazing <laughs> 
Oh man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Holy smokes. Legislation currently or pending that, that you've become involved with that obviously would tie most directly, of course, into big cats. We've had some great wins here in Florida. It used to be legal to keep cougars as pets, and so we finally got the Florida Wildlife Commission to deem the cougar as a... We have had some great wins. We've had this, we had that. Okay, so kind of sounds like she's got some expert sensing in there talking about shared experiences uh, as a result. So let's keep going. Last one animal so that they can no longer be handled and out in public and walked on leashes and all of the kinds of crazy things people were doing. Out on public so they could walk on leashes, uh, all the crazy things people are doing. That's another SE thing. I'm going to put a point for extroverted feeling, though, because she's talking about people in general. It's kind of coming off like an ethic and not a moral, very external. I'm going to keep going. Oh, uh, she, also initiated, uh, she also initiated another point there. So we're going to put a point down for initiating. And it was also another affiliative statement. So let's keep going. But in July of 2011, probably the most profound change came about as we got involved with the International Fund for Animal Welfare, the Humane Society of the United States, World Wildlife Fund. Ooh, name dropping. Yeah. Name dropping. That's a point for expert thinking, technically. Nice. Lots of name dropping. Hmm. And uh, my goodness, my mouse is having a hard time. There we go. Born Free and the Animal Legal Defense Fund, as well as the Ian Summerhalder Foundation. And we all got together in D.C. We sat around a table and said, OK, with all of our collective organizations, what can... We all got together in D.C. We all did this with all our collective organizations. It's more SE, more affiliative, you know, OK, <laughs> Get, getting in there. And we do to end the problem with all of these big cats living in backyards and basements and um, being bred for all of these horrible purposes. And what we came up with was a three prong approach. Three pronged approach. Okay. And so what we decided to do was the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service had inadvertently created a loophole because the zoos, the accredited zoos, when they breed tigers, have to go through a lot of paperwork to do that. And people were breeding white tigers, which are crossbred and inbred and don't serve any kind of conservation value. And so U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service didn't want to have to deal with all the paperwork and decided to say, okay, if it's a generic tiger, then they don't have to jump through all these hoops. Well, that's... Well, if it's a generic tiger, then they don't have to jump through all these hoops. That was... Um, hmm. It's kind of... She seems to be very outcome focused in, in talking about like the results of how it's moving forward and not really... Um, not really like making multiple attempts here. She's talking about all the requirements that have to be met. And typically I'd say that as systematic, but she's not saying it's the best way of doing something. She's just concretely saying this is what actually happened as, a, as an expert in sensing standpoint. And she seems to be stating facts after facts. It's not really, you know, expert thinking in terms of status or these people's status. She's just being matter of fact about it. So I'm still going to put another point for TIFE. But apparently the audience is very split on her being a TI user or a TE user. So that's kind of getting a little interesting here. Um, so let's keep going. But if initiating an outcome and uh, compared to Joe Exotic, I definitely going to put a point down for correct. So definitely a structure type for sure. And an SENI structure type, which would put her down as ESTP, ENFJ, um, and then uh, ENTJ. So one of those three, basically. Uh, so we, we have those in the run. And even if we got it down to TIFE, we'd still have to delimit between the ESTP and the ENFJ since they're both Templars. So let's continue uh, with that there. Just open the floodgates and these people were breeding tigers like crazy, mostly trying to produce white tigers because people would pay to see white tigers. So what we did was we went to U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and said, you guys really need to close that loophole. And they put it out to the Federal Register. We really need to close that loophole. We reached out to these people. Um, again, that's another expert in sensing statement. Very affiliative as well. Uh, so let's keep going.
year ago. And for the first time ever, they got 15,000 comments in support of closing that loophole. Usually they get maybe 1,200 to 1,800 comments on mm. a really hot topic. Yeah. 15,000 is just like crazy. So that was hugely successful. The second prong of the... Okay. That was technically a TE statement, but I think she was being matter of fact about it. So I'm going to put down a point for both. Technically, they kind of cancel each other out. Approach is that... We believe that USDA could stop all of this cub petting and all of the breeding where breeders are taking the cubs from the mothers at just a couple of days of age and then passing them around to people, charging $15, 20 for people to handle them. And Okay, she's stating what people are getting out of things. Uh, that's interest. That is an interest-based statement. So we're getting further and further away from ENTJ at this point. Plus the fact that, you know, we don't have any points for pragmatism either. So, uh, you know, it's looking like ENFJ because these two are pragmatic because, you know, the affiliative. Let's keep going because the audience still seems to be extremely split on this. We felt like that already violated the Animal Welfare Act as far as creating tr stress and trauma for the cubs. And stress and trauma for the cubs, obvious FE statement, uh, also in another affiliative statement, an expert sensing statement as well, uh, looking more and more like a Templar, but it's just super affiliative, direct initiating control, direct initiating outcome. Uh, Jay is looking more and more that she is an ENFJ, a very cruel ENFJ. Yeah, so, and I, I've never thought of ENFJs as cruel. <laughs> Um, well, I have an ENFJ father, Railgun has an ENFJ father, and I could personally say that they are probably the most cruel human beings you've ever met oh. uh, because they're vice of cruelty. Remember, oh. virtue and vice, people oscillate back and forth, you know, between the virtue and vice and as, uh, as caring and, uh, as benevolent as a, uh, an ENFJ can be or look or appear they also have this insane vice of cruelty. Um, so, so yeah, definitely, um, definitely an ENFJ for Carol Baskin. Um, so this is an ENFJ versus ESFP showdown is what you're saying now. <laughs> yeah, that's what it looks like. So what do you think about, what do you think about their showdown? What do you think about their, ta her tactics against him? In, in uh, her tactics against him? Yeah, stalking him, going to the malls to try to shut him down. Stalking him, yeah, oh, malls. Yeah. So, you know what? Railgun actually mentioned uh, something about how affiliative people always put one over on pragmatic SE heroes because they just um, they 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 draw everything out as long as possible and just suck them dry and make this attempt to just outlast them and use the rules the affiliative rules as their weapon and okay. even to the point of creating the rules when the se hero isn't looking like that one time where joe exotic started passing out this uh photo of these dead bloody rabbits everywhere and all these smiling faces to make her look bad well she actually had that photo copy written and then sued him and then won the case against him, which got her a million dollars out of that. And it's like, oh, OK, I'm just going to create this rule of it being my copywritten property. And now I'm going to sue you. Basically, that's uh, that's pretty devious. People get pragmatic people in trouble. That's how people get pragmatic people in trouble. Like, yeah. Seriously, they just like they just try to goad you into a fight or into an argument that is that they've done research on that's illegal. They try to goad you into basically suing you. That's how every affiliate tries to get every pragmatic, especially pragmatic SE users because that SE rage and they don't really notice it. But little does the SE pragmatic person know that it is illegal <laughs> and the affiliated person that messed up one have been uh, planning it all along. This is why NFJs, when they go into battle against SPs, typically the NFJs win because the NFJs can use the existing rules or create new rules with their NFP shadows and use the affiliative as a weapon to defeat the SPs. Why? It's because SPs are, out of all of the types, are inherently unaware of the consequences of their own actions. 
And because of that lack of awareness of consequences of actions, this basically causes a consistent uh, trap, basically, that uh, SPs end up falling into. And they can get really taken to the cleaners, just as Joe Exotic was, uh, uh, you know, with, um, I mean, because he thought he had her, you know. That's why it's yeah. best to, like, door slam them. Yeah, it is best to door slam, but he couldn't let it go. And everyone everyone warned him to let it go. And it's funny because you see FITE users, they always attack people's public character. They always attack everyone's reputation. They always attack their status. That's how they attack people. Um, you know, like if I was going to go after an enemy, I would destroy all of their relationships with all of their loved ones, you know, uh, and like, if I was really evil and like, if they were like an NE user as well, if they were like, if I was fighting against a crusader, I would get all of their close friends and family who respect them the most to value me more than them, to want me more than them. That's what I would do. Cause I attack their heart. Right. But Joe exotic attacks status because FITE users attack each other from a status point of view. And it's so funny to watch an FITE user attack a TIFE user with status because a TIFE user just doesn't care. <laughs> Typically, they just don't give a damn. And, and, and to watch Joe Exotic constantly attacking her on her status, really, I'm like, dude, you're just wasting your time. And everyone knew it. Everyone knew it. Even that ISTP guy in, shoot, North Carolina or wherever he was. Um, so you're not talking uh, Doc Antle, are you? No, not that guy. The other guy, the guy that sold uh, that sold Doc Antle and Joe Exotic some animals towards the beginning, and then he eventually bought from him. He's always sitting on his little uh, wooden chair on his deck, you know. Oh, Tim Stark? His, Tim say, Stark? Tim Stark? Yes, Tim Stark. That's the guy, yeah. The ISTP guy, where he goes up to Doc Antle and he's like, hey, man, you know, you don't have to show me nothing about your animals. You got to show me everything about getting all those women. You know what I'm saying? You know, <laughs> that's it. I guess. That's yeah. Funny. Like, <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, that ISTP, like, oh, holy smokes, that INFP super ego coming out. It's like, yeah, how do you get all the attention, all those women? You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, it's like, come on, man. Like, it's that, freaking ridiculous. That was a common theme here. Everybody seemed to have multiple partners whether you're gay like joe exotic or straight like the rest of them multiple partners i thought that was interesting it's jay it's more common than you realize i, I think it culturally it comes from books like sex at dawn by christopher ryan and cecilia heathrow uh who consistently are preaching polyamory um uh my infj mentor uh is a polyamorist uh, and, uh, that's, um, where I learned about the lifestyle initially at first, basically. And then, uh, and then throughout my life, it just kind of devolved, uh, you know, into that where I found myself, uh, you know, either Stockholm syndrome to the polyamorous lifestyle as I inferior depraved loyalty to the polyamorous lifestyle and fomenting the lifestyle or finding myself the victim of that lifestyle. It's not, it's not, it's not a really, it's just not really a healthy way to do it because it just consistently leads, you know, at least in the context of this show, we consistently see it leading to depravity over and over and over. Now that's not to say that it's not an invalid lifestyle. It is technically on paper, a valid lifestyle. It's just not the lifestyle that I choose to live my life by. And it's really lame to me that, you know, I had all these negative experiences, but because I've had those negative experiences and I've been able to get myself out of that lifestyle, I've been able to, you know, live by my conviction and be my own man and be absolutely loyal to my wife, Railgun, who I, I'm willing to take a bullet for. Because if you think about it this way, no greater love than when a man gives up his life for his beloved. This is the standard I tell everyone. Do not have sex with a man unless he's willing to die for you. Or do not have sex with a woman unless you're willing to die for her. If you're really getting to that point, if you're really, really getting to that point, are, is, it, is, it, is it really possible um, to live the polyamorous lifestyle underneath that standard, underneath that principle? You know, some people will try to debate it, but 
I, I would venture to guess that it's not actually that way. So the bottom line is, it's just my effie child going off right now with my eyes such a subconscious saying, you know, it's unethical. It, it, it's it's completely unethical. And you see Joe Exotic, he's got, um, he's got two husbands, uh, John Finley and uh, Travis. And then he ends up getting Dylan Passage, a third husband, uh, mm -hmm. after Travis kills himself and then John Finley starts cheating on him with, uh, with women basically. We're and sure. yeah. And even Joe exotic admits that he, he married straight men that they were actually straight the whole time. Yeah. Which, which basically, yeah. Which is basically ad admitting that he did manipulate him. Yeah. He, he absolutely flat out did manipulate them. You know, and with Travis, it was with drugs. Um, and with, uh, uh, with John, it was more of, uh, it was attention and, you know, I'll make you feel wanted and I'll give you all these things and, you know, and, and showering them in these, these areas, you know, it, it just, it just got pretty crazy. Um, are we typing those gentlemen tonight or, uh, or are we just going to state their types? Um, we can state their types. Um, I think there's there's more primary characters that we want to spend a little right. time on, if that's okay. Yeah, yeah, we'll spend more time on the primary characters. So, based on uh, based on my estimation, um, so John Finley, which is the first husband of uh, Joe Exotic, definitely seems to be registering as an ISFP, um, and it's interesting to see that given that it's a camaraderie based relationship. Um, I have noticed in personal experience that in the area, while I am not a homosexual in homosexual or gay coach, gay culture, there is super high camaraderie relationships in gay culture. One of the reasons why is, and, it's, and this is more so in on the masculine, on the male side, not not actually the, the, the female side, actually. The reason why is because camaraderie is based on shoulder to shoulder relationships. It's really hard for some men to allow themselves to succumb to the feminine side or take on those feminine roles within relationships, within intimate relationships. Uh, so as a result of that, it's really hard for a face-to-face -face relationship to be sustainable. As a result, uh, they end up opting for shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder relationships uh, in, in gay culture. And those shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder relationships are, are best if they're high camaraderie relationships, which means intra-quadra. Which is interesting uh, because, you know, Travis, Travis, while he was not uh, in the same quadra as uh, Joe Exotic, like John Finley was, Travis was still an SP, just like the other two. They were all three of them SPs. Travis was an ESTP. Um, and this ESTP, you know, his NI inferior came out, he lost all hope, and he shot himself. And I figured that out like around episode four because I'm like, well, wait a minute. Travis isn't being interviewed. He's not being interviewed. It's because he's dead. And I'm like, yeah, he killed himself. And sure enough, sure enough, in the show, we find out he killed himself. And a guy on on Joe Exotic's staff watched watched him put a gun to his head and blow his own brains out. It's just, it's ridiculous. This ESTP lost all hope and just blew his brains out. Uh, even, and he was just, you know, he went full on hedonist as ENFP super ego took over. He went full hedonism, uh, on that. And then he's like, is this all that there is to life? Is this really all there is full hedonist? Cause he wasn't happy. And you can even tell like my wife, she's, she's watching, she's an ESTP. She's like, there's no way Travis is happy. Just listen to him. Right. He's, he's absolutely miserable in this life. And, you know, and then. And then the the director of the show is like, well, there's lots of drugs involved, and uh, and how Joe would use use drugs, uh, you know, to get to Travis basically, and uh, with John, you know, John, it was always stuff and things and gifts was was kind of how how Joe did it with him. At first, it was meth with John, but then John got clean and he gave up on meth. And then John ended up getting one of the girls that worked on the zoo pregnant, basically, and then you know moved on. Uh, and had left Joe at that point. And then Travis killed himself. And then Joe like freaked out. The CSFP freaks out. And then, and it would just seem like he cared more about his loss of reputation. I mean, at first it seemed like he was sad, but after a while, you know, 
his own friends were accusing him and talking bad about him behind his back that he's just using Travis's death as a way to cash in on additional publicity because he was financially hurting because of the battle with Carol Baskin, the legal battle, which is absolutely horrible. Even to the point of being accused of, you know, putting up the perception of crying because he kept onions inside of his pockets, basically, uh, you know, by, by people on his own staff. And it just, he went, it just, it's absolutely ridiculous. But then after Travis dies, after John leaves him, he gets involved with his other kid, Dylan Passage. Mm-hmm. Dylan Passage is an ISFJ, same age as bringing on all the, he likes him, he likes him as a 19 year olds, you know, right. and it's, 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 it's Dylan Passage, you know, and uh, like, Dylan, uh, this ISFJ, and it's it's like it's it's the whole thing. It's not just it's not just the gifts, you know. It, it's it's not just the drugs. It's it's all of it. And uh, uh, and and Joe was not gonna was not gonna give that up whatsoever. And Joe finally got his golden pair. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And, and was going all out after that point. And then. But then, interestingly enough, all the groundskeepers and the zookeepers of Joe's Zoo are like, oh, hey, guess what? You know, Joe seems to be improving a lot better now that Dylan's around, you know, and then just. Why is that? Is that something uh, characteristic of ESFPs where they always have to have someone there? The, with- the, the thing is, is that SE heroes more so than SE Parents, um, because SE Parent is very pessimistic. But SE Hero is so optimistic that just like, because they can flip and it can turn into an inferior function. Don't forget, your hero can become an inferior function when you're going into your subconscious. So the hero is still capable of feeling the same kind of fear that SE Inferior could feel. And that ends up becoming, uh, you know, it's not just fear of abandonment it's more of ni inferior saying because fear of abandonment is s inferior but it's like more like ni inferior gosh i really hope he doesn't abandon me you know it's it's all about always making sure that ni inferior has the hope that they're not abandoned you know i i love my wife she has ni inferior and i i will never abandon her i i understand that you know like it's funny she tells me every now and then that you know ne she's like she's always telling me about how much of a burden it is to have extroverted intuition and always feel unwanted and feel the sting of feeling unwanted all the time and how she's really happy she's an se user but from my point of view i'm really glad i'm not an se user because extroverted sensing having the burden of the fear of abandonment or anything that comes with abandonment. Yeah, SE users have the advantage of forgetting that in the moment, moment by moment. It's not there stinging them in the back of their mind like extrovert intuition does to you with your introverted sensing. Okay, yeah, she's technically right about that. Gotta love her TI parent. But I still see like, at least I could use my head's eye to endure and persevere and be steadfast in, in the situation where I'm unwanted. Right. And I could build up my desirability to allow me to become wanted. But for experted sensing, they don't have that. It's all about constant performance, constant, you see. Mm -hmm. And I find that a far larger burden with my own mental psychological preferences. And for SE Hero, with NI Inferior, just loses hope. And that's the thing. Like Travis. He was willing, he was willing to be there for Joe. He was willing to, he even said, you know, like, I don't understand what he wants. I don't understand what he wants because there's any demon just couldn't lock in on that. He was trying to get Joe to be loyal to him. And Joe was not trying to get him to be loyal to him. And, and over time, this face to, or this, um, you know, Travis wanted that face-to-face relationship. He really did. He wanted it, even though he was super unhappy. It's like he was convincing himself that he wanted the face-to-face relationship. Maybe he didn't want it all along, even though Travis told people behind Joe's back that he was actually straight. And in some cases, he was accused behind his back of sleeping with some of the women on the zoo, just like John Finley was. This provides a huge case study, you know, to show you guys that 
Bottom line, camaraderie doesn't work for relationships. Don't listen to socionics. Duality is a lie. It doesn't work. Okay. Uh, and, you know, even, even people in gay culture who end up in high camaraderie relationships in my coaching practice and people that I've met and known in my life, they are not happy in camaraderie, shoulder to shoulder relationships. Even homosexual folk need that compatible relationship where there is compatibility. You know, it's, it's just, it's just there. And that's why Joe didn't mentally start turning around until Dylan came on the scene, at least until the next big fiasco happened, of course. <laughs> but, but it, again, it's a case study, you know? No, it is indeed. Um, one more question. Do you think, do you think uh, Joe really was aware how manipulative he was being? Or did he just see it as this is, I love these guys. I, this is the way I express my love. I mean, sometimes it's really interesting. Actually, I had a conversation with an FI parent recently, sometimes like, and it's, it's, this is really interesting, like, but I've noticed and take this a grain of salt. This is FE child talking, but I've noticed that a lot of people baby FI parent, like they just baby FI parent over time in like a big way. And because they're babying FI parent, FI parent is not able to properly parent the child such as, so the TE child ends up believing their own bullshit. Like they end up, they end up becoming the, the comforting lie that they tell themselves. They end up becoming it. And unpleasant truths is scary. And so the people around them baby them and no one has the guts to expose their comforting lies. This is why ESTPs exist, thank God. This is why ISTPs exist, thank God. This is why you exist, Jay. Templars, this is why Templars exist specifically to expose these people. Um, and, uh, but given the fact that Travis was a fellow SE user, he couldn't have that with, with, uh, with Joe because Joe needed uh, an ENTP around, a superego around to call him out. And that just never happened. And in fact, I don't see a single ENTP on the show whatsoever. Not one. I didn't you see know. one. No. No. You know, and uh, based on that, it's just it's just real tragic what's happened to, you know, Joe's little harem. But he's not the only one with the harem. So shall we segue? <laughs> oh, yes. Yes. Um, do you want uh, one thing before we do? Sure. Sure. Um, is I want to get back to Carol real quick. Okay, yeah, Carol Baskin. Is she capable of murder? All right, so I'm going to exercise my God-given right to free speech at this time okay. and say that I fundamentally believe she murdered her husband. You do? Yes. Yes, I do. And why do you say that? Because... Using my ESFP superego when while being triple systematic and using the interest of my superego, the one person who benefited the most from Don Lewis's death was Carol Baskin by far, even to the point of um, what really what really spoke to me was when she got the wills stole uh, and the wills were taken out of the office of the executor of Don Lewis's estate. Um, when she got those documents, the, she had the documents, uh, the will changed to disappearance and included disappearance in the will, you know, and, uh, She's guilty. she is so guilty. <laughs> uh, like, like any, like anyone could do that. She really is. And, you know, with that being said, it's just, it, it's, it's really, it's just so Ridiculous. Oh, and her brother was on the police force. Yeah. And right. the cops didn't even check the van. They let it stay, uh, you know, for three days before it, and, and it was moved from a potential crime scene. Wasn't even investigated or nothing, you know, and uh, she ended up taking over the estate. And exactly five years and one day, she got a judge to uh, say that Don Lewis was officially dead. And then she inherited all the estate instantly. And only 10% of it went to 
his family, and she got everything. Yeah. Um, and there was police reports leading up to that saying that Don Lewis and uh, shall we reveal Don Lewis's type? Yes, go ahead. Uh, Don Lewis is an ESTJ, and he uh, he got married to this ENFJ woman that he met on the street, Carol Baskin, basically. And um, uh, Carol, uh, and he's a philosopher, and he thought he was real slick, uh, pretty business savvy fellow. But he thought he was going to be able to divorce her while taking all of his estate with her. Well, she threatened to kill him, at least so he claimed as a um, on the police report. He told all of his friends about how she had threatened to kill him on multiple occasions. No one actually witnessed anything, but it ended up on the police report. The police couldn't do anything technically because as their lawyer pointed out, uh, it's a free country, which means, you know, it's technically free speech. If they're threatening to kill you, we can't necessarily do anything. Uh, we only prosecute uh, and put someone away after it's done, you know, fair point. Right. And, uh, and it, and it's gone, but you know, all of the mounting evidence, because I mean, I love how the director did it with this documentary, because at first he's like, Oh, exotic cats are cool. Yay. And, and all this, and this lifestyle is interesting. And then he starts talking up Joe and then he starts talking up Carol. He starts talking about Doc Antle. And then all of a sudden he starts bashing Joe and then he really bashes Carol. And then he's, and then he starts bashing Doc, <laughs> and then it just starts weaving together. You know, it kind of sounds like all of C.S. Joseph's lectures about all the individual types and how it's just one grand narrative and just watching one of them at a time leaves you with, oh, he doesn't really like me that much. But if you actually watch all of them, you'll realize that that's not the case because I'm fair with everybody, but whatever. Like this director of this documentary was very fair, I could tell. Yeah. He was, he was certainly... Yeah, he was good. He was biased, very biased yeah. towards himself and making <laughs> money for him. But uh, but he was fair. Yeah. I appreciate that. Right. So um, <clears throat> did you see the picture <clears throat> of Carol Baskin and her husband, Harold, when they got married? Howard. Yeah, Howard, oh. the INFP. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Howard, the INFP. And this poor INFP. He's, she's holding him by a leash on their wedding day and he's dressed up like George of the Jungle with this cat print <laughs> stuff, you know? And I'm like, wow. I mean, Howard Baskin and John McAfee have a lot in common, just saying, you know? So, um, S.E. Child then. Yeah, very, very S.E. Is that, is that how it comes across to you? Uh, oh yeah, definitely. Very S E child. Uh ENJs, uh like let's be honest, all ENJs for the most part are completely into BDSM, like straight up. It's just an S E child thing. They love them the toys, they love them all the little new experiences that I get to do. It's like I open up my my red my red room of pain and have all these closets full of all these toys and all these weapons and all this leather and things, and it's like a big menu of all these little different things that I can do. You know? <laughs> Welcome to SC Child, folks. Oh yeah, I wonder what kind of toys. And you... them, and them, and them INPs love every second of it. <laughs> they may be uncomfortable at first, but don't worry; those ENJs will train them. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, awesome, awesome. All right, back to the uh, the harems. Yep. Uh, you want to go to Doc Antle next? All right, sure. We can definitely uh, we could definitely do that for sure. Let's go to Doc Antle then. All right, where's the where's the video here? Let's see here. Okay, good old uh, Joe Exotic interview one. Kara Baskin interview. Um, Howard Baskin. Doc Antle interview one. Okay, copying that one, and we're gonna get down to it right here. And then I'm gonna start sharing this right here. Share screen. Screen two for uh, spending some time with us. I'm very excited to talk to you right now. Uh, for everybody listening, uh, everybody watching already knows who we're talking to, but everybody listening. The, the cameramen were sick to death of him. He was a freaking amateur about the entire process. But He was an amateur about the entire process. Okay. Who's an amateur about the entire process? Let's find out. Okay. We're going to erase this here. Wonder what you guys think Doc Antle's type is. Please put it in the live stream chat. I want to know everyone's guess because yeah. everyone that I've told him is actual real type. 
people have like been like whoa uh you know it's uh <laughs> not who it's not who i what i thought he was frankly oh yeah yeah, yeah definitely not yeah. so all right guys who is it who who is doc antle what is his type uh for those of you who watch the show you have to tell me what do you guys think his type is we got we got it now um so i i know what it is but uh well, we're gonna we're gonna go through it for you um so, okay, uh, let's, uh, well, I'm sure it'll catch up second here. They'll put in their, um, oh, everyone's saying ENTJ. Okay, so far, ENTJ. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So he just called someone an amateur. Uh, so uh, F-I-T-E statement um, for that. Uh, making himself look good there. Everyone's saying ENTJ. Okay, let's, let's, right. let's do this. Let's do this. Yeah. It saved him in a lot of ways because I just thought he didn't know what he was doing, but he had such an. He didn't know what he was doing. Oh, another TE statement and an SETE statement. Oh, already looking like a wayfarer, getting closer to that ENTJ, right? You guys think it's the ENTJ, huh? huh. <laughs> Alternative plan. Is this dude came to me and just said, "Hey, I'm making a show about wildlife education, conservation." I got Richard Branson talking about all the lemurs on his island, and I'm a turtle dude. I'm the number one collector of turtles in the room. The, the dude's got millions in turtles. Uh -huh. And I've got all these turtles and I'm going to talk about the world of conservation for wildlife. And I know you've done all this great stuff with your tigers and all of your work in Sumatra at your ranger stations that you've built there. I want to just <laughs> going on and on saying, Hey, he's doing this. He's doing this. He's this, he's, he's this. Okay. Fair enough. He's kind of direct. Isn't he chase? Say again. He's informing. Isn't he not? No, no, he's very, very direct. He's he's constantly. Uh, uh, I, I definitely maintain direct so far, but uh, you, you know, let's let's keep going. Lots of people have some division over Doc Antle, so let's keep going. Document all of that, and I know you've got stuff going on in Africa. I'm going to come with you to Africa on your next trip. This is it, man. This is all, and then and that's for two and a half years that he's hitting me with that five different times of long days of filming, interviews in a chair for hours. And I didn't get it exactly what was going on. So he and never told. I didn't get it exactly what was going on. Okay. He talks about process a few times. Definitely systematic. Uh, talk about what this person knows. SENI, definitely a wayfarer, hands down, for sure. Uh, very direct. Definitely very direct. Um, but uh, let's, uh, let's, let's keep going. Let's, uh, uh, let, let's keep going. <laughs> <laughs> told you he was making Tiger King the entire time. Oh, absolutely not, man. This is conservation education about captive wildlife, helping to save the wildlife in the wild, which is my gig. It's my, it's what my heart's about. And so he, it's my gig. It's what my heart's about, you know, and it's, it's all about, you know, all these things. Okay. Yeah, sure. Pretty, pretty, uh, pretty true. Let's keep going. Gosh, please, please go pragmatic. He was able to step all over <laughs> me because I thought I was pulling off what my a dream job. And he said HBO had it a lock and it was going. What a fucking scumbag. So you do him the favor. You help him out with the lie that he told you about. And then he tries to make you look like a douchebag when you're clearly the cleanest one of the three people in this documentary. I hope not by leaps and bounds, right? I mean, the other two characters. No, you were the Apple store. Woo. You were the Apple store. Joe was like an Android. And then Carol was like a beeper or something. I don't know what the fuck was going on with that. Carol was a beeper. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. That ENFP. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Oh, that's so good. Doc so Antle was good. the best of the three. Huh? That yeah. Was yeah. <laughs> Ellie. He's out of this world. Yeah. I mean, if I was you, I would be like, I don't want to be included with them at all. Only drama is going to come from the two of them. Straight up. I told that exact story on camera huh. probably a dozen times because they asked me 900 questions. So he just initiated there. I was technically initiating. He initiated that point. Mm -hmm. During the 900 questions over hours and hours, they'd slip in a question about the industry, zoos. And then what about Carol? Yeah. What about Joe? What about, and, I, and I'd give them, you know, i just say this is this and that, but I'm not into that, guys. I'm not looking to do a show about those guys. I don't want to be in the drama. They got trouble. There's nothing but trouble going to come out of it. 
okay, no problem. And then on the side, Rebecca Chalkin, who's his co-director, the other person, the, the other producer of the show, right. she's on the side tagging the staff, tagging all the girls that work here on the side and stuff and going, who do you sleep with? Who's your boyfriend? Uh, what do you do over here? What's it like here? What really goes on? What's the drama? And then they started telling me that. And I said, that's not cool, man. Leave the staff alone. It's not going to happen. I said, if she keeps this up, it won't happen. They leave. They come back a second time. She blabs again. And I said, she's off the set. Mm. She's not out on the property ever again. I don't want to. Oh, yeah. <laughs> she's off the set. Very systematic. Um, he actually, uh, he made a, he didn't make an actual statement, but he was insinuating uh, an, an abstraction with what could happen if she stayed. But I want to keep going. I hear from her. See you later. And they kicked her out. And they came three more times without her because she was so odd. And I'm like, why is she so obs He's still staying on. He's still staying on topic, though. He's not really initiating outside of that. He's still very much on topic and just expounding from there. So going to technically put a point down for uh, responding, but uh, we'll see. Um, if you guys remember in the show, actually, uh, when it comes to him talking about his wives, each of his wives has their own little house. But he has his own house, his own castle that's his own and no one else's. It's his. And they also made a statement about how he spends, sometimes he spends a lot of time alone, especially when it comes to his elephant or his particular favorite pets or especially when he's doing the dirty of killing some, potentially killing some cubs as the uh, director of the uh, documentary insinuated uh, because everyone's like, oh, no one where he goes, you know? So uh, another point of responding for that. Um, let's continue, shall we? Seth, ah, uh, little did I know because we were making murder man. INTJs aren't loud. Tell that to Rush Limbaugh. Damn and madness, yeah. not <laughs> conservation of Tigers in the wilds of Sumatra. Yeah, it was. Um, they had to. They had to make you more salacious than you were. Oh yeah, they had right? to go. I mean, they had the some crazy to... bat lady that just murdered her husband. Probably, at least that's what the world thinks. Meyer show um, for another magician, and he brought tigers in to supply the guy with. Well, right. then the town got crazy about it. Humane. I'm going to skip ahead. We have very little genetic diversity. And between lions, tigers, leopards, and jaguars, there's very so little talking about genetic diversity, talking about the best way to breed, and that's systematic. Awesome. So closely related. Tigers are 10 times more related to each other, the existing tigers in the world today, than a guy from uh, China is to a guy from Ireland. We have way more genetic diversity, and we're really tight ourselves. So the big cat. Okay, if you guys want evidence for extra sensing inferior, let's talk about that. <laughs> when he's on, a, how many times during the show is he like, you know, constantly trying to get them to do a certain shot uh, in a certain way? Or he's talking, oh, it's a really expensive shirt, you know, et cetera, and then complaining about that. Would really an FI inferior do that in front of other people? No, they're not. That's an FI child response, complaining about the fact that, you know, oh, this is a brand new shirt, and then this... Uh, this this tiger messed it up just for you know for the for the fact you know or the liger that he was showing for this one little thing that they're doing and whatnot. He it was uh, from a point of insecurity of his visual aesthetics. I remember the scene where he's getting on his really freaking huge couch, which I'll admit I was kind of envious of because that was a really nice couch. Uh, let's be honest. Um, he also did another one there, and every single time where he believed that they weren't actually rolling the camera. They actually were rolling the camera and it caught a lot of his SE inferior insecurity in the process. So, uh, and because he was trying so hard to control the aesthetics and tell me where exactly in this entire interview, much less in the entire documentary, is he actually outcome focused? Where is it? Hmm. Where is it? Because I'm not seeing it. I'm not, uh, I see him, you know, doing a lot of things, but not with specific planning. He's just kind of shooting from the hip and making sure that he's getting what he wants per se, but it's not really like individually planning it. Now I understand that like, 
you know, from uh, yeah, it does seem like a feeler because that's what you have, fi child, right? You know. Anyway, let's let's look at the second interview that you have too. Yeah, there's. I have a, yeah. I have a feeling that the audience is not very convinced, Jay. But let's keep okay. going. One of the things we noticed was your love life was brought up, obviously, in this show. And, um, you know, some people were saying, he's got nine wives, three wives, four wives, five wives. How, how has that been? Because you've been under some scrutiny yourself. And it, what, what is the situation? What is the truth? The truth is, 25 years ago was the last time I was married. I was married to a lovely lady who died in a car crash here in Myrtle Beach. She's the father of, excuse me, she's the mother of Cody. Okay. And, uh, my daughter Tawny, my gosh, it's like it's so like it. He's he's just coming off in that way. He's like it's like ESFP cognitive transition. You could tell that like he's just doing it for the show. It's not really like who he is specifically. You know, uh, you know he's not he's not. Um, remember that one uh, that one guy who got like really rich off of social media he was an ENTJ, and everyone's like, no, he's an ISFP, he's an ISFP. And I'm like, no, he's 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 an ENTJ and it took, and we even verified him over and over again. And people are like, Oh, there's just no way, you know, that's the way it is. It's like, yes, actually it is that way. You know, it's, it's the same kind of concept because, you know, these people are obviously like cognitive transitioning during their interviews. And then when you actually watch them in the documentary, especially the parts where the director has the camera rolling and he doesn't even aware of it, it really shows his inferior function. It shows his insecurity. Because if he really was an ENTJ, an ENTJ has any critic and is a little bit more aware of the fact that anything could happen in that regard. And FI inferior would be really, really scared to really screw up in front of even other people. Do you think an FI inferior is really going to make a statement like, oh, this, this, you know, uh, and come off super greedy like over the fact that his new shirt was just ruined by this liger? Is, it, is really an FI inferior going to do that? No, an FI inferior is not going to do that uh, because they're so afraid of not looking like a good person in the eyes of other people that they're not even going to take it that far. And SE Child would know that that would be giving people a bad experience. SE Inferior, while afraid of giving people a bad experience, it's more of SE Inferior is more under the influence of FI Child. FI Child's just way more upset, twice as upset, then F.I. Inferior would be that the shirt was ruined, for example. And then as a result of that, he has that reaction. And it's like the F.I. child literally behaving like a baby that his shirt was ruined. Whereas it's not S.E. child complaining like a baby that his shirt was ruined. It's F.I. child because he's like, wow, I feel really bad about this. And he's, he's, he's being a baby about it. And then his S.E. Inferior comes out in that scene. Just like his S.E. Inferior comes out, you know, with throwing the Cubs on 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 the couch it's the same it's the same kind of thing you know uh, so like if i could take excerpts directly out of the show i could point it out to you directly where it is but these interviews i mean he's cognitive transitioning it's hard and i could see why people would label him an entj because he's cognitive transitioning hard into his esfp when he's obviously abstract this is why people when they type people with letter dichotomies they end up coming up with false positives and label this guy an entj when he's not he's just cognitive transitioning in this situation but when you actually watch the documentary how often do you see him alone compared to how often he's with other people like when he's riding on top of his element he doesn't have somebody with him in the in the in the river or the lake that he's in with his elephant he's doing it by himself he's doing it by himself when he's with his cats his little cats he's doing it by himself the guy is responding like he is an introvert like i'm sorry it's just it's just it's just what it is that's why he has all his girlfriends in their own separate houses and he has his own house right the separate houses exactly exactly so you know this guy this guy is an intj for sure he's absolutely an intj and you know i i i'd be fine with like debating this you know but the guy is is straight up an intj and if i have to do another verification episode for it like i will and luckily by then there's enough footage from the netflix show on youtube for which i could utilize to prove my point but yes the guy is definitely an intj now something that i know of 
out of all of the types, when it comes to being polyamorous, SE inferiors are the ones who exercise polyamory more than anybody. SE inferiors do. Because that performance anxiety and having multiple partners really satisfies the performance anxiety of extroverted sensing inferior. Um, and uh, I've, I've seen this, I've seen this uh, among tons of INJs in my life. And it's because of these INJs in my life and their influence on me that got me to participate within that lifestyle. And I'll be straightly honest, I, um, I regret, uh, I, I regret taking part of that lifestyle. I, I absolutely do. I regret uh, fomenting it. I regret being a, a victim by it. Uh, and I, I will never have any parts. Uh, I'll have nothing to do with that lifestyle uh, again, you know, but it really SE inferior can really impact SI inferior and SI child in some cases and really kind of bring them into that lifestyle, et cetera, uh, as much as, uh, you know, as much as people don't believe it. But yeah, I mean, you, when you look at like the Bible of uh, polyamory, which is sex at dawn, I mean, what type is Christopher Ryan? That's an INJ, you know? And then you have people like, uh, um, you know, going beyond that, it's like, or you have, um, you know, so it, it's neither here nor there. Um, it just, uh, well, I, well, Courtney Bauerfeen, I'm glad you have that point of view, but I'm just trying to state that even INJs have that SI inferior depravity within their shadows. That's what I'm trying to get at here. That's what I'm trying to lead up to. Um, so, there's that's when it uh that's how it manifests and again they use polyamorous relationships um and and i and i and i wonder if this is also how it is uh with i mean for the most part like a lot of that experience comes from my experience in gay culture um for the most part but i've also seen it a ton with uh with women too like um like one time i coached i coached this um um this woman who had a daughter who was, who had a boyfriend, but also had girlfriends at the same time, which is kind of similar to what we'll see uh, very so soon with some other characters to go through as well. But, but yeah, I mean, I'm sorry that we don't have the appropriate footage to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt for the sake of the audience uh, that Doc Antle's an INTJ, but uh, um, based on my own personal analysis and everything I have, I am definitely saying that he is an INTJ. And for the sake of the uh, for the sake of brevity and the length of the show, we're going to maintain that stance moving forward. Um, well, I think, <clears throat> Chase, in both these uh, clips, Doc Annell's kind of on the defensive, um, especially here, because what they're talking about is um, he has a lot of like his daughters and nieces work at the zoo and the show was trying to portray his daughters and nieces as his girlfriends. And so that was kind of the question that this guy posed to him here. And he, he, you know, he's a little triggered. So maybe that has something to do with how animated he is or how emotional he is in this particular um, clip. Right. Forgive me, Jay. I'm a little distracted because the YouTube chat thinks that I'm claiming that polyamory is supported by the Bible and I'm not making that claim. Oh, yeah. I don't, I don't know why they did that. Um, but, uh, and even Topher Suarez of all people's like, give Railgun a, a mic, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, why are you saying that, sir? We don't live our life as polyamorists. Yeah. No, no, we don't. My wife has my loyalty. So it's like, yeah, I mean, what do you expect, Marky Mark? I'm an NTP. What do you expect? Come on. All right. Anyway, please continue where you left off, Jay. Yeah, so All right. <clears throat> so, um, yeah, just that he was being defensive here. So that might be why he's coming across the way he is. Um, That's a good point. As it will pose to him. Um, <clears throat> so let's move on then. Um, why don't we move to, uh, to Jeff Lowe? Oh, okay, Jeff Lowe. All right, we'll move on to Jeff Lowe. Okay, um, Jeff Lowe interview. It's titled interview, right? Yes. Okay, cool. Yeah. With Dave Spade. Okay. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> 
Let's get that going. All right. There we go. Hey. How you doing, Dave? <laughs> hey, guys. What's going on? Not much. How about you? And what do we got back behind you? My big Bengal tigers are back there, and they're supposed to be up front. Here's one. Which rapper did you get those from? They came from um, 50 Cent. <laughs> they, they, I, I, That's just it. You know, Tyson, Tyson will get one, and all these guys get them, and then when they get big, they're like, oh, they get big. Yeah, we end up with them. Oh, yeah. After they take a picture on Instagram, they get rid of them. So that was pretty matter of fact of him, you know, and he's also stating like uh, what other people are doing in that regard. So that is extroverted sensing. I'm going to put a point down for uh, TI. Uh, and that's Jeff Lowe. I don't quite know Lauren's type, but I believe I know her type. But I, I let's see if it changes from my initial supposition based on this interview. Um, is the sound coming through just fine? Yes. All right. Awesome. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. What happened to the uh, member when I don't know if you're around then when he's he's blaming me. He thinks that because I was on his life insurance policies when I came here and took over the zoo because he figured if he died, he had to have all these cats cared for. So he put me as a beneficiary. Right. So one day he's out filming one of his gubernatorial or presidential bid campaign videos. <laughs> and this cat grabs him by the foot and drags him. through. The oh, he blames me. Okay, very uh, expert sensing. Talking about how when he's uh, how when Joe is filming one of his gubernatorial videos, uh, and then this thing happens, it's being very direct uh, with it. Um, and uh, <clears throat> well, I want to get more evidence first before I go further. So he didn't want to admit that he was just dumb and shouldn't. Have oh, he didn't want to admit that he was just dumb. Okay. Yeah. That's a, that's a very SE, uh, high SE, high TI thing and a very Templar, uh, way to say something. This man is a Templar and definitely, uh, direct. He just didn't want to admit that he was dumb. Okay. Fair enough. Uh, yeah. And, uh, <laughs> going to put that as a uh, concrete but also a pragmatic statement to say on a uh, um, on a, uh, uh, a David Spade interview of course have been in there not paying attention so of course it was you know they sprayed perfume on my boots or my shoes just to get me killed so oh yeah doing an expert sensing parent <laughs> oh my gosh it seems like, oh my gosh. So uh, we have ourselves an STP with uh, Jeff Lowe here, folks. An STP. Oh. Is he, uh, is he a, uh, an ESTP or an ISTP? Oh my gosh. Let's see. <laughs> yeah, we, right. were, we were here that day. It's funny. But in reality, the problem Joe did is that he would actually give shoes to them as toys. So when they see shoes, they're like, oh, that's a toy. So he had little flurry things on, the, uh, on his shoes and... Dragon Number one mis Wow. Um, I'm going to put a point down for her being an SI user, uh, remembering that, and then remembering what would happen in the process. Uh, so definitely with Joe, putting her down as an SI user. Mistake. Even I know, you know, I know not to do that. Yeah, exactly. The first person I thought that was guilty was Carol fucking Baskin. <laughs> There's no doubt. There's no question. I mean, if you can... We know so much more than that documentary showed. You know, Netflix whitewashed a lot of it, I think, because of legal exposure from something they can't prove. But you know, we have we have a lot more evidence against her that just wasn't shown. You don't you know we have a lot of more evidence against her that just wasn't shown. That was uh oops, um that was direct and uh that was also very concrete for him to say. Um, he also stated the interest of uh the legal exposure as well. So that was an interest based statement. So he's definitely a uh, hardcore STP, um, and uh, but he's staying on topic pretty well. So I'm leaning towards responding at this point. I don't write a will that says in case of my death or disappearance, you know. <laughs> yeah, I, listen, I watched it, and there there has to be more to it than her just giggling and riding her bike around the property. Yeah, does it remind because you of the Wizard of Oz watching her ride that bike around? I did think she had, you know, I don't know much about it. You know, it's whatever. Does that remind you of the Wizard of Oz? <laughs> 
I love STP jokes. Oh <laughs> my gosh. And he seems so collected, even though he initiated that point. I have to I have to state that uh initiating, but that wow, that was really good. That, that was that was so good. I want to look at the other interview. Uh, let's get to another one here. Be really... careful. The first 10 seconds of this one is okay. rated, so is what? X rated. Okay. I will um so as soon as not it's... continue that one then. Yeah, not... you, can, you can do it as soon as it starts, just jump ahead about okay. All right, cool. I'll uh, do my best to uh pause this one as quickly as I can. Pause. Pause. Okay, cool. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Skipping ahead to like seven minutes in then. Her her um, efforts to stop cub petting when all they were doing is they lied to her and they're just gonna flip the switch on her and, and make her look like a you know a criminal. Right. But you know, so there's no she's they're just gonna flip the switch on her, make her look like a criminal, interest based, uh stating what is again concrete SE for what other people are doing, being very matter of fact about it. Um, let's check to see if he is uh, outcome of progression. Been bitching and moaning, and you know they did the same thing to us. They said, "Look, we're gonna, we're gonna make expose Carol Baskin. We're gonna make Joe look like an idiot." And then they tried to make it look like I stole the zoo. Right. I'll, sh I'll show you the paperwork. We get up. Uh, Joe dissolved his zoo. I my zoo was formed after he dissolved his corporation. He shut this place down. He was out of money. And Lauren and I came in here. We ponied up probably 120 or 30 thousand dollars to get all the back bills paid. So they turned the electric back on. They turned the water back on. We the meat distributors would start delivering meat again because cats were going hungry. So you know we came in here and we saved his ass. And we came in here, we, yeah, expecting recognition. You know, Effie, you know, give me my recognition because of all this hard work that we did. As I'm being super concrete and pragmatic in the process. Okay, fair enough. All right, but let's look at outcome progression. He's stating specifically what Joe did. Joe dissolved his company and has a very interest-based, you know, ISTP. Like, sometimes you got to be careful around those ISTPs. It's like, well, you know, you may not know the opportunity that I mean, that I'm going to take here. You know, it seems very anti-child to just kind of jump on that standpoint. But Once I got it making money again, that's when Lauren and I, we were tired of his shit because he's just a diva. And we just, you know, him and Lauren were butt heads every day. She's a red-headed cunt, and I, you know, I'd have to, yeah, you would call her one cunt one more time, and I'll knock you the fuck out. Joe so, called her oh, oh, yeah, Lauren a cunt? Yeah, yeah. Oh, my yeah, goodness. Yeah, so, you know, we, Ooh. so we. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Definitely going to need to set this uh, this stream to mature. Oh, my, <laughs> my goodness, for the video. Like, Really? <laughs> I said, look, we're going to Vegas, and you run this place. You know, he, we, the cats were more healthy once I started buying meat again for, you know, for Joe. So we just said, I can't deal with this. I'll, I'll kill this bastard if I stay here very long. So that's so when we went to Vegas, and then we were getting calls from you know, people in the park saying, you know, he's blaming you guys. This park's not making money. And, all right. So we snuck back in here because I knew I had to be making money. We snuck back yeah, in. That's so movement. He's just it's so moving. He's not speaking in terms of outcomes. He's just, you know, adding to it while simultaneously staying on task uh, or, or on uh, on um, on topic. Yeah. So he's an ISTP, hands down. He's an ISTP. Um, and too bad we're not seeing more of Lauren here, but I maintain Lauren is an ESTJ. So those two have a golden pair with each yeah. other. Yeah, uh, in my estimation, the episodes that I watched, definitely she's an ESTJ, um, you know, and they're swingers. And I, I've known a bunch of ESTJs, male or female, being swingers um, for some reason. Uh, it's it, it's more common with ESTJs than most people think, uh, especially when they're uh, 46 or older, I would say, statistically speaking, uh, in that age group for ESTJs. That's a that's a bit of a surprise uh to me too um estjs you know i i thought it was funny if you remember maybe in the show where lauren was pregnant and they were talking about her giving birth and the name of their new daughter and getting a um a nanny for her and uh yeah, nanny oh, oh yeah the au pair yeah know? and jeff uh, 
you know, Jeff said, Jeff was the one who was allowing the nanny and he got to pick her out and he showed up his cell phone with the, uh, you know, big breasted one that he wanted. So this is a fascinating, uh, relationship they had i mean it's it was like all of them had this kind of a, a thing going on well hey you know everyone's got exotic animals so let's just leverage that to get as much uh you know as much pussy as we possibly can apparently that's just like and what you know right and so talking of the exotic animals yeah. exotic animals got them the partners that they wanted did they not i mean is that why yeah. Is that why they're really into it, maybe? Well, it also is an insane amount of money, you know, yeah. and then all you have to do is just learn how to take care of animals and how to breed them. And then you're just looking into, you know, and the selling of the animals as well. You're making like it's a huge money maker. So you literally get a, ha a harem and you also get a, a huge amount of money. Like a lot of people out there are like, well, who wouldn't want that? You know what I'm saying? Right. Like, right. Well, so, um, you know, as the show progresses, essentially, uh, Jeff, Jeff Lowe um, and um, uh, Jeff Lowe, basically social engineers or what I think social engineers, uh, Joe, right out of his uh, zoo. Is, is that how you see it? And absolutely. Absolutely. ISTPs, while they have expert intuition trickster, they're still interest based. They have that INFP superego that they can still use. Uh, and uh, like they can definitely manipulate their way into things that serve their own interest. I actually have an ISTP uh, close to me in my life um, who uh, will do anything to take advantage of a situation if it serves his interest specifically. Um, I give him some things every now and then uh, sometimes in a bid to test him to see if he was actually going to do something or if he was actually going to offer help. Rarely does he ever reciprocate. It's almost as if I am forgotten by him uh, very quickly as soon as he gets what he wants or what he's looking for. And he's very suggestive, even though he's technically triple direct, but he can still use his NI child to choose exactly what to say, when and when not to say. And that's what SE Parent can do because SE Parent is very responsible and very res precise with how people can respond. This is one of the reasons why the bronze pair between an ISTP and an ENFP is super powerful because they're like this, this they're, they're like this power couple because the, uh, you know, um, the ENFP opens the door and the ISTP closes it. It's like literal Bonnie and Clyde type of situation. And ESTJs can also, uh, you know, be that door opener as well. And in some cases they are a philosopher type and they have expert intuition in an optimistic slot and they can pull it off. Not as well as an ENFP can, but those two end up being in a relationship and it turns into, hey, who can we shice next? And ISTPs end up being on there. ISTPs are supposed to be holding ENFPs accountable, but when an ISTP is being all super hypocritical about things and being like, hey, you know, I don't have to be responsible as long as I'm not telling else to be responsible. But if I don't have to be responsible, that means, you know, it's okay if I'm going to let my partner just manipulate someone because it benefits me too. And it's not my fault that they're a sucker and I have FID, but I don't care. It's not my problem. You know, it's not my fault that they're not as smart as I am, you know, and they just kind of, you know, an ISTP can basically mirror the depravity of the ENFP manipulator in that, in that particular case. Wow. And, you know, there's not much they can, they can do it. Even worse, they could use their ENFJ mentor side to mentor other people into uh, being depraved to serve their own interests, even though it doesn't look like that from the outside. Don't forget, guys, like it doesn't matter what type you are. Manipulation is and social engineering is capable for anyone, absolutely anyone, you know, and it, it doesn't matter. All types are guilty of it. It's just more types are more notorious for it than others. NP types are probably the most notorious, I guess. Well, ENP types being the most of the most notor notorious with INFPs, you know, there as well. But it's not to, it's not to say that NFJs can't do it. Look at Carol Baskin and her marriage to Howard. Uh, look at, you know, look at the the murder of Don Lewis. Hashtag free speech. Mm. 
And, you know, it just like, it, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it's, it's, uh, it, it everyone is capable of manipulation in some capacity. Why? Well, it really comes down to the child function. The child function is, is where, where the need to manipulate comes from because people are in situations where they don't have power. They don't have power over anything. So they instead, because they find themselves powerless, they use the game of influence to give them that power, just like a child would exert influence upon their parents to get what they want. You know what I'm saying? Uh, my dog is an ENTP dog, but that dog is manipulative AF. Oh my gosh, he's so manipulative. And he knows exactly what to say, when to say it, to try to get the the the, uh, the humans to, to snap to, to serve him, etc. And like the only way to get him to like, you know, because if you go outside his routine, oh, here comes the depravity. Oh, man. And it's just it's just ridiculous, you know, just seeing that, you know, from from a dog standpoint. And the fact that he's an ENTP to present as seriously ungrateful. And then after a while, like, oh, you've been in your crate for that long. And, you, you know, you have, it's not time for you to go outside yet. It's not your scheduled time. It's not your scheduled time. You you have a schedule. You are a puppy. You have a schedule. You will adhere to your schedule. And oh, is he so happy every time you open that cage when it's his scheduled time. But when you open his cage, when it is not his scheduled time, he doesn't appreciate it. There's no, there's no gratitude. There's, he, he's, he, this dog is not thankful. And it's the same way with human beings. I'll never forget the day that my INFJ mentor told me, Chase, people are just like dogs. You just treat them like dogs think about how powerful a statement that is, you know, especially his exploits. You know what I'm saying? You know, like it's, it's a situation like that. Like, you know, like a lot of people just, they're just not, they're just not aware. They're just, they're just so not aware of how easy it is to manipulate. And you think that manipulation sometimes is on like a, a person by person, person basis. No, no, social engineering expands to the macro. Social engineering, entire crowds of people, entire bars. You could create a bar fight like that. Uh, you could uh, you could social engineer an entire community, an entire city. You know, uh, you could social engineer an entire nation or a group of nations. The more people they are, the easy it is. The more people involved, the easier it is to social engineer. Especially if you think about it in the context of a harem. Think about it. How easy is it to initiate how to manipulate all the members of that harem mm -hmm. when you have so many different people, so many different fates, so many different opinions, so many different judgments, so many different perceptions all in one place. And what affects one affects the other. And if you want a desired outcome out of them, you just use, you go after one, you're not getting it. So use another member of your harem as a conduit to get it from that one. And it just turns into depravity absolute total depravity and it's like okay really is that is that lifestyle really that sustainable it just turns into depravity you know like like on the level of you know i, I don't know like there is so many bad things going on in this show that it's like you're wondering to yourself how is fire not falling from the sky as i told you before how is this even possible right you know, Travis's death, Don Lewis killed free speech, um, you know, and uh, uh, all these uh, young 19 year old men being manipulated into their hammer harem, uh, even even Carol Baskin relying on free labor for her zoo, oh, free labor. And then and then her zoo is making a ton of money too. And she has the audacity to make herself look like, ooh, I'm Big Cat Rescue. Big Cat Rescue is just a brand. She is doing, in some cases, as the as the documentary would say, worse to the animals right. than the others are. But then she makes herself look out. She's using the power of the affiliative for her own personal gain, making it look like she's benevolent when she's actually really cruel. You know, making and and leveraging her virtue and her vice, and then her 
absolutely blind, loyal INFP servant of a husband is protecting her interests by using the power that INFPs wield because INFPs are bloody brilliant, the most brilliant of us all, let's be honest, and they have absolute mastery of politics, narrative, and power. Why else do you think Robert Greene, of all people, an INFP, wrote the 48 Laws of Power? Because he understands power. So does Howard Baskin. And she is able to wield absolute power because of that. I mean, and Doc Antle is absolutely right in warning Joe, don't go after her. Right. Because even Doc Antle knew it would be a losing fight. There's no reason to do that. Do you think an ENTJ, if Doc Antle was really an ENTJ, would have been able to let go of that? With his T, with TE Hero and the the harm to reputation and whatnot that Carol would do to Doc Antle at times, no. TE Parent, however, was pretty responsible about that, and as a result, he knew that it was best to disengage from Carol because he knew what Carol was capable of. As if the NE Demon of Mister Concrete Joe Exotic would have figured that out, and he didn't, and it cost him everything absolutely everything and once again the affiliative beats the pragmatic there's only one time the the pragmatic ultimately beats the affiliative four boxes of liberty right you get on the soapbox soapbox pretty pragmatic but it can be affiliative depends on the narrative then the ballot box well that's agreed upon that's affiliative land right then the judicial box, that's also agreed upon because it's all about the rules. No, for the pragmatic to really truly triumph over the affiliative, it's the ammo box. Combat, violence, the threat of death. That's really the only way in the long run that the pragmatic can triumph over the affiliative when it needs to. Because the pragmatic is willing to have a lynching, which is pretty scary if you think about it but we've seen it so many times in history you know was that not what their little plan was when it came to carol <laughs> I think it was i think it was so walk us through that jay because i didn't see that part of the show mm -hmm. uh so so um you're talking about the uh the very end where they uh they get Joe for his, his, uh, okay. Um, so what they do is Jeff and, um, oh, let's see, I'm trying to remember his name. Oh, um, Jeff comes into the zoo. Uh, Joe introduces him to his friend, James Gerritsen. And James and uh, Jeff, they see this feud that, Joe has with um, uh, uh, Carol and they start planning to take over the zoo and they want to take, they want to set Joe up and, and, uh, and uh, have him arrange to uh, kill her. So they, they all knew about it. Um, um, Alan Glover, who's a friend of Jeff, that was all arranged by Jeff, apparently. He's the ISTJ bald guy, right? The ISTJ bald guy. Okay. And, uh, so this was all this was all planned out, put together, and Joe was saying, "Yeah, let's do it." He was he. They were manipulating him in in at least the way I see it, and taking advantage of his hatred for her. He pays uh, Alan. Alan runs off with the money, doesn't apparently doesn't go down there. But anyway, he takes the fall for it. They end up with his zoo, and then they have a falling out. Um, um, James. So Jeff Lowe and that Mas Medersen, Masterson guy? Yeah, Gerritsen. Gerritsen. Yeah, the kind of the, the, the businessman is what they called him, the businessman who had the strip clubs. <laughs> right. Where John Finley always wanted to go and uh, Travis always wanted to go. Um, so, um, yeah, it was, uh, uh, they pulled that together to, uh, to get him. Um, the thing is, is that Gerritsen became an informant and he got, uh, and then Jeff got a plea deal. Alan got a plea deal. They're all off scot-free. 
uh, as we know, Carol's Carol is uh, she wanted to be a martyr. She even said she kind of hoped she had been killed because it would have furthered the cause. Uh, but she <laughs> wanted, she wanted to be a martyr. So everybody seems to have won except Joe. And so you know, you almost feel sad for Joe, even though he's as bad as the rest of them. I, I you know, I don't know. Um, the thing is, though, is that where where do you exact justice in all of that? Right. Like where, where can you? Like I'll be honest with you, what has been shown in this documentary is proof positive that at the end of the day, mankind is is mankind really, really like able, capable, qualified, whatever to judge their fellow man after all of that. Yeah, and especially when you look at it from a macro standpoint, not just from a micro standpoint, from a macro point standpoint, think about all of the other people that were not in the documentary that were complicit. Mm -hmm. Think about them. I remember them talking about Vernon, you know, Vernon Carol Baskin's father and how they insinuated that he had a lot to do with Don Lewis's disappearance, oh, you know, yeah. Ooh, yes. think, like, and he, you know, and he's a, he's an ISTP fellow. Um, and like, how, I mean, I guess that would explain why she left the home as early as she did, because she's polar opposites with her father, interestingly enough. Mm -hmm. um, but like, when you're in that situation, like, how do you, how do you navigate that? You know, how, how do you navigate that? Um, and it just shows you like, some things are far, far too advanced for us. And, you know, a court of law will even go so far because you know, that there's a lot of blood on people's hands and there's a lot of pain and suffering that they've caused to other human beings and crimes were committed, but no one was actually really held responsible. Well, and I don't know that the story's over yet on all that. So for example, um, Doc Antles, after the show was filmed, um, um, I think it was in December of 2019, his, his park was raided. Um, Joe himself, he's going all any demon. He's working with PETA now and he's got, um, he's got Dylan pulling out of the storage unit, all these hard drives and all these records of all the sales that he's made to all these characters, sales of cubs and cats and whatnot. So he's working with PETA to bring them all down because his freedom is now denied. He's going to pull them all down. And uh, uh, wow. so apparently there's more to come, but, uh, and they, they referenced several times that um, uh, they're looking at uh, all of them um, for, for more. Uh, so we'll see more, we'll see more arrests or whatever. Yeah, like they, they said there's a rumor going around about episode eight uh, coming out about this pretty soon. And I, I don't know much about that, but I've, I've heard rumors about it. It's like the rumored Parks and Recreation episode coming out on the 30th of this month. I don't know if that's true either or if that's just uh, an April Fool's joke or something. But but either way, like uh, I still just it, it really amazes me. I mean. It's it, when you watch a documentary like this, like people just have to understand this is normal. This is normal. It's a little bit similar to the culture that I grew up in, you know, except we didn't have the exotic animals, but there was still, there was still a lot of this. I grew up on an Island surrounded by, you know, a lot of white folks, um, you know, living in you know a, a trailer house thing um you know with wheels on it or whatever and it's very cold black mold that kind of thing but we were poor but we we made it work we made it work no matter what because you had to make it work right and you know i was thankful to grow up there and i was thankful that my mother wasn't working and whatnot and she was able to protect me and also not put up with my depraved crap because i was a very depraved child i'll admit it very depraved child um and then uh but, you know, in that culture, like you end up having like sexual abuse, drug abuse, uh, which guess what? It's pretty normal for all cultures to have that. It just manifests differently. 
but you know, in those situations, like, what do you, what are you going to do? Right. It's why, you know, when you become your own person, your own man or your own woman, you have to make the conscious decision to rise above it. Something my wife told me earlier today after I was watching the show, because this show, I'll admit, just absolutely screwed with me because it brought back so many memories of when I was growing up and so many memories of my young adulthood. Mm -hmm. uh, it was just extremely painful in the process. And it just makes my expert at sensing demon just want to burn down all of reality. Absolutely. But then all of a sudden, I got my wise ESTP wife tell me, hey, Chase, you know, reality in this particular situation yes it definitely sucks but if you want a good reality you have to choose to have one and i'm like she's right it's just like voltaire says you know a man is free when he chooses to be right you know uh you have to choose a good reality you will not be given a good reality i say that again especially to all you snowflakes out there you will not be given a good reality you have to choose it and you have to make it happen on your own strength. Nobody owes you anything. It took me till 27 to figure that out, how entitled and depraved I was. No one owes you anything. You have to make the conscious decision to make your life the reality you want it to be. And if you don't know how, go read a book. It's not that hard. Last I checked, libraries are free. It's your own fault if you can't just wake up just like it was Joe's fault because he just let his status, his TE child status go to his head because that's all he really cared about at the end of the day. He only really cared about his status and it cost him his freedom. And what's more important to an ESFP folks, their status or their freedom of choice? What's more important? think it's pretty obvious it's freedom of choice and he lost it don't do what joe did don't do what any of these people have doing just don't you have to make the choice because i mean he just decided to believe his own comforting lies maybe you folks should make the choice to understand unpleasant truths so that you're armed with the tools to create a reality that you want not the one that you expect others to give you. Yeah. That just sets you up for a whole bunch of manipulation and a whole lot. Say it louder. So that just sets you up for a whole bunch of manipulation and a whole bunch of lies because then people will come in here and be like, oh, don't worry, I'll give you this in exchange for doing way more for me than what I'm going to do for you. I just watched that cycle over and over again. And I figured that out when I was 13, um, that it's, it's something I have to choose. And... It's not always going to be easy, and it's definitely not going to be pretty until I put in the work. Yeah, and you'll be alone while doing it. I was. Wise words from an NI inferior, folks. How is it an NI inferior like my wife could have so much more hope than most of you people watching or listening to this right now? How is it? Utilize her as an example to understand that you really have no excuse. You really don't. You have to make the choice. I made the choice, you know, with my past involving homelessness and abuse and uh, financial ruin multiple times, failing my family and being kicked out of, you know, like my, my, my church, my community, those kinds of things, uh, my reputation destroyed, um, letting down investors uh with a company uh that because i used to own a gun manufacturing company my life is literally a life of failure but i didn't succeed until i made the choice and i think that is the ultimate lesson that we have to learn when we watch this documentary tiger king because i'll be straight you know like the depravity that i see in the show tiger king that's why we have the story of Noah's Ark. That's why we have the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, you know, and, you know, count your blessings, folks, because fire is not falling from the sky. Consider that. You know, like how they say, like, sometimes being cheap can be expensive. It's kind of yeah. like, it's the same thing. 
because if you think about it, it's like, uh, oh, am I really trading way more than I think I'm trading and uh, like way more of my life? Am I wasting way more of my life uh, for in exchange for a few comfortable moments? Or if I put in the work now, will I gain way more reward than what I was seeking, like short term, I guess, instant gratification? I used to have a problem with that big time. Yeah, definitely. That makes no sense, but it makes sense in my head. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, uh, Jay, is there anything else you'd like to add before we close the show down, sir? Oh, and I, I don't think I could add anything more to what, what you uh, were just telling me <laughs> today. Um, uh, pre enough. appreciate it. I mean, a lot to learn from this show. It's not just entertainment, is it? It's uh, no, if we look deep enough, there's a lot to learn. So, but thank you, yeah, um, thank you for your help getting all the videos together, doing all the grunt work for this. I, I couldn't have done it without you, Jay, and the encouragement in watching this show because it was absolutely brutal and yeah. brutalizing to me. Like, it, it was hard. It, it so. I really appreciate the support and support of the rest of the team. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, who are we going to do next? Do you think? Uh, well, uh, after tonight, are you sure you want to do this again? Yeah, yeah, we'll keep doing it. Yeah, who, who, who else? Who's uh, our next victim? <laughs> well, we had talked about Cardassians last time. It's not my favorite, but. Um, well, what are the other options? If there are any other options? Well, maybe should we run a poll with the audience? Is that possible? That's true. Yeah, we could, we could definitely put a poll. Folks, if you guys uh, have any uh, choices or options for us to do the show, leave it in the comments section uh, below. Um, that would be awesome. Uh, if you guys want us to do uh, more of these and which particular groups, uh, probably the Kardashians will be wow. next. But uh, So if you guys can't come up with something better, we'll do the Kardashians next. And uh, so, yeah, we'll have lots of fun. Um, We'll do someone especially that you like, Chase, since this one was a little difficult. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll get through it. <laughs> That's okay. all good. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you all, and thanks for everything. And uh, uh, also, uh, CSJ or CS Joseph Responds, new YouTube channel just launched. It's only got a couple of videos up. We're posting a new video every day. Uh, so uh, make sure you guys are checking them out. They're pretty small videos. Um, but uh, they're a little bit of fun and uh, just hanging out, experimenting, uh, still talking about psychology. So check that out when you guys get an opportunity. Uh, and with that being said, folks, I'll see you guys later. Have a good night.